it's an absolute uh, privilege and honor to be asked to be here and, and share the work and have these uh, incredible actors here uh, kind of helping us with that. Um, my dad used to tell a story about a mule. Uh, <laughs> he grew up on a farm in southwestern Iowa. Uh, and it always left this lasting impression on him. And I grew up just like listening over and over to the same stories about um, the day the skunk climbed into the like chicken house and uh, you know the day he left the light on and they finally got electricity and his dad liked to two light bars to him and uh, all of these wonderful stories which seem now kind of violent about my grandma. <laughs> but we're in fact endearing and one of those stories was that the mules wouldn't go. And my dad was in the carriage, and my grandfather was very impatient, and they just sat down. And he just couldn't get them to go. Uh, and he was a very inventive man, and he had an idea. He walked quickly to the woodshed and came back with some kerosene. And with that kerosene, he kind of tossed a little bit under the mule's asses and put a match. And they took off, as he often said, like a by God rocket ship. Uh, <laughs> over the years, uh, from maybe 2009 to uh, 2013, uh, that story changed. The story that had been so consistent in my childhood. Uh, you know, eventually, the you know, the purpose for my grandfather's anger was no longer clear. Uh, the kerosene disappeared. Uh, my father disappeared from the carriage. Uh, even the mules disappeared sometimes, leaving something that you know seems to bear almost no resemblance to the story that had been before. Um, and so I stepped in, and I became a part of telling those stories. Uh, and I got interested in that. And so when I came here, I, I wanted to explore that. I wanted to think about uh, how the stories that people commonly tell, when they get dementia change, what happens to them, uh, to whom do they belong. Uh, and fortunately, there was this excellent program that Amy and Mary Marshall run, uh, the Oral History Master of Arts program, uh, that came and kind of taught me that you know, I've always listened to my dad's stories and felt that I don't really have a story to tell on my own. It's part of the reason I came to oral history, but that, I don't know, maybe I do. <laughs> so, anyway, enough uh, meandering prologue. Uh, this play, which you're about to see a stage reading of, uh, comes from interviews that I did with uh, two people uh, in New York City throughout my project, a project in which I was interviewing people with dementia uh, and their friends, family members, and caregivers, uh, you know, separated by half a continent by my dad, trying in some way to be here through that. Uh, so, thank you, Dr. We gaze through invisible windows of two very different East Village apartments, two separate apartment buildings. On stage right, we see a living room in the apartment of Timothy Samberg. Jagged piles of books, European films, and documents dot the floor. A small table with a glowing lamp sits a short distance right of center stage, and on its left sits a wooden chair atop of a donut cushion, and on its right is a short stool. Upstage right, there is a bookshelf full of paperbacks, on top of which sit two trophies. Downstage right, there's a TV on a small entertainment center facing diagonally upstage. On stage left, we see a living room in the apartment of Mary Rykoff Sandberg, which is well organized with brightly colored abstract art hanging from the walls and a half-finished painting resting on an easel at downstage left. Just left of center stage is a comfortable looking office chair angled slightly to the left. A full-length couch, also comfortable, sits a few feet away. 
in his apartment, Timothy sits facing 5 a.m. Timothy in the chair and 5 a.m. on the stool. In her apartment, Mary sits leaned back in her office chair, having a lip-synced conversation on her cell phone with a friend. Let's start out, Timothy. Can you tell me a little bit about your childhood? I don't know how to answer that. I mean, um, I was born in 1945 in Manhattan. Um, uh, my stepfather came into the picture when I was seven years old, at which point we moved to Long Island. Okay. Uh, uh, I grew up with uh, my mother, uh, my stepfather, my younger sister, and my mother's parents all crammed into one house. I'm not sure where to go with this. Sure. Uh, can you describe your home in Long Island? What, what did it look like? There was an upstairs and a downstairs. He is a wonderful man. He is a wonderful man. God help us for good communication. What did your father do? Do you, you call him? He was a salesperson and then an executive in a paper firm. He had a tremendous rageful temper. Mary finishes her conversation and hangs up. She stands up and wanders downstage where she fixes her hair at the window. She folds her arms, looks down, and watches cars drive by. Is there a specific instance when he was full of rage that sticks in your memory? Yeah. One that sticks out is when I, I dented the car and I was petrified and my mother was petrified. When he got up and started to yell, I started to scream that I was leaving and then my mother started to scream that she was leaving. That's the scene that stays in my mind. I'm uh, Mary Rykoff, uh, now married, Mary Rykoff Sandberg. I grew up in suburban, white, middle-class Detroit. We lived near a golf course in an amusement park with a Ferris wheel and an ice skating rink and a wooded area. Dad was a child with a depression. He worked for Ford Motor Company as an executive. Tell me about your mother. I remember when he would break dishes. Sometimes he was really mad because he had a germ phobia. So as the cat walked down the kitchen counter where he cut things or when he served food, he took the dishes and smashed them all over the floor. I remember hiding in the closet once, wishing he wasn't around anymore. Your parents are like gods. And when God is dangerous and unpredictable, it's extraordinarily hard on a child. I don't have too many memories of my mother, even though she was around all the time. Mom sewed and cooked and cleaned and raised the kids. My father didn't help at all around the house. And my English grandmother was always in the basement teaching piano. The English teach their daughters to keep a stiff upper lip and say the least possible, really. Mom was always wallpapering and painting the walls. Did you think a lot about your anxiety? I don't know why, but when I was seven, I was walking around the schoolyard wanting to be dead. And then at 12, I was crying at camp and wanted to be dead. Yes, to answer your question, I was aware of my anxiety, but more so my depression. I was a rebel in the family. During my adolescence, I experimented with drugs and alcohol, and the boys came later. I snuck out of the house, ran away from home. I was my father's worst in my in an old world macho guy who thought his daughter should become secretaries or teachers or if nothing, or nothing, if not a housewife. How did other members of your family relate to you? I, I remember speaking to the family doctor when I was uh, about being unhappy. I was 250 pounds at the age of 12. They were concerned. Yes. How does it feel now uh, talking about I talked about it so many times in so many groups. It's fine, it's fine. Okay. What, what was school like? Which school? High school? Why don't we start an elementary school? If you can describe Oh, that. elementary school. I was fat. I, I felt awkward. I was picked on. Even in elementary school, I didn't feel comfortable around girls. 
my friends ended up going to Harvard and Yale and Princeton, all very prestigious. Going to Penn State was not. I, I did transfer to Brown, but later on I found out it was my stepfather's connections that got me in. But I'm skipping around. I mean, I was on the basketball team, junior varsity. My friends were varsity. What memories do you have of basketball? Well, I love basketball. We had a basket outside one of the houses, and we played basketball all day long. Of course, I can't play anymore, but I still watch. That's great. You mentioned you went to camp as well. I went to summer camp a number of years. The irony of it is that you can see them up on the bookshelf. I got two trophies, one for the most liked camper and one for good cheer. I was miserable. I didn't have a girlfriend. Dances at the camp were torture. The memory I have is when my parents visited, they would leave and say goodbye over and over again as they walked away. I became more comfortable as an invisible person than an invisible person. Jesus Christ, the main creature. 5 a.m. waves goodbye mockingly to Timothy, who waves back, glassy-eyed. 5 a.m. crosses the stage and plops down on his side, on Mary's couch, his left arm supporting his head. Mary takes no notice. One solution was to use the alcohol. On my father's side of the family, we ran a restaurant. All they did was drink and play cards together. The Ukrainians knew how to have a good time in my family. <laughs> if I wanted to relax, I'd like to have a drink. I took some liquor to one party, and I must have had a blackout. Once I overdosed on aspirin trying to get high, I woke up at home and my father was furious at me. Remembering something, 5 a.m. sits up and speaks with sudden interest. Startled, Mary drops her brush and spins around. You said your mother didn't speak much, or that she doesn't speak much. What does her voice sound like? I don't know how to answer that. I, I don't know I can hear it in my head, but, but I, I can't describe it. Is it high? Does it have a whine? Is it angry when you hear a voice? Oh. No, just not with that. So what happened after high school? I did well in college at first. Very well. <coughs> uh, I threw it away. I got involved with this group of people who had well non-academic values. <clears throat> I did LSD. That was at the University of Michigan. So I had a bright academic future, but I, I tossed it. I was falling apart. My mother and grandmother came to me and said, uh, we want to send you to Europe. I guess it was a great thing to do, but I was clueless. I was a 19-year-old going off to Europe alone. Of course, all I did was wander around, and I got exploited by men. I mean, I just saw England and Paris, which was great. And I did begin to make art there, which is great. But my judgment was so impaired. I just don't advise people to send 19-year-olds off to Europe alone. Anyway, so I went to Europe, and uh, and I wanted to go to high school. Hello? Tell me about deciding to go to Penn School, Penn State. Penn State was not my decision. OK. Uh, well, tell me how you got to Penn State. That was my father, uh, my stepfather's decision. Now, I, I didn't pick the clothes I wore. I didn't pick the school. I didn't pick my shampoo. I was a person without needs. He gave me a typewriter or a, or a dictaphone. I didn't ask for it, but I couldn't say no because I was afraid. The college was his choice. I didn't know why I was there. And I started to drink heavily. Well, there was a girl. I, I could talk to her fine when I was drunk, like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> and when I was sober, I tried talking to her, and my voice would crack. So I drank, and I had blackouts. Art school felt exactly right. Although art schools have problems because they're collections of these wild children who are all doing drugs and alcohol. 
Five teenagers enter Timothy's apartment from upstage right and creep across the floor with joints and bottles and paper bags, giggling and shushing each other. One drops a bottle. Timothy turns, sees them, and shoes them back off stage. I got deeper into this subculture. I don't mean to cast aspersions because it was a wonderful group of people. It was liberating. It was exciting. I became excited about the world and became a liberal. At Brown, I had to drop out after one semester. While Timothy talks, 5 a.m. strides to the bookshelf, removes the trophies sitting on top, and places them both in Timothy's hands. At that time, there was not a focus on alcoholism in this country. I had a breakdown, and they didn't ask me about alcohol at all. The next five years, I was in and out of hospitals and shrinks. I was sedated with very strong psychotropic medications. Believe it or not, I still see a psychiatrist today. Mm -hmm. I had to get out of Detroit. And Chicago seemed like the nearest cool place to go. That was in Boston. <laughs> so, I went east. I was in Boston the morning I got the call. Then I met a woman in my early 20s who really did not have an alcohol problem. I pulled myself together. I went back to school. I got an MSW at Rutgers, became a social worker. Later on, I got one year at Fordham in a doctoral program. I did all that. My dad is dead. I can still hear my sister saying, and then I said, no, not our dad. And she said, yes. 5 a.m. picks Mary's paintbrush off the ground and places it in her hand. Like Timothy, Mary accepts it without acknowledging 5 a.m. Mary brandishes the brush like a blunt instrument. Type A guy. He had a massive coronary out of the blue. Turns out he had high blood pressure, so it was going to happen, and it did. I went home right away. I, I, I didn't even call my job to say what happened. So it was my job. He and I were always arguing. He went to talk to his grave. She wanted a son, and I didn't want one because of my experience with my father. In my early 30s, a son was born. I left, fueled by alcohol. Six months later, I was shooting heroin and cocaine. Yeah, yeah. From the age of 35 to 40, I was involved off and on with street drugs and alcohol. I lost my job. I lost my right to see my son. I lost my home. died after my father. She was always a little overweight when she became diabetic. She lost one leg. Kicks one leg towards the audience. And the other leg. Kicks the other leg, landing on the couch with both legs raised. And then my mother couldn't take care of her. She went to the nursing home and lost her mind. Mary lowers her legs and speaks as if making a diagnosis. Timothy snaps out of his emotional display, turns around, and notices 5 a.m.'s absence. Probably some kind of uh, vascular dementia, some kind of dementia that's associated with diabetes. She had a lot of strokes. Timothy gets up and returns the trophies to the bookcase. It was a merciful dementia, though, as far as I could tell. Because I remember very clearly how she's lying in a nursing home and she can't get anywhere. She doesn't have any legs. And she thinks she's touring England singing. Growing up in England, she was an accompanist. So this could have been a memory or a fantasy. What was your communication like with her? As Mary talks, Timothy searches for 5 a.m. backstage and behind the TV. He pulls a book partway out of the bookshelf and looks behind it. Finally, he sits back in his chair, pulls a mandarin orange from his pocket, and starts peeling it over the table. Well, I kind of did what you do. Uh, I was attentive and, and tried to draw her out and let her know how much I cared about her. Once, near the end, I brought up saying goodbye and she blew me off like, that's a depressing subject and why are you talking about this? 
I left and never saw her again. <coughs> so, why did you come to New York? I'm not sure why I came here. It, it wasn't that far from Boston. I, I guess I came here because it was just, you know, New York. That's enough of a reason. I found my community. Community of irregular people. <laughs> we, we weren't stiffs. We were artists. We were hippies. They were gay. This was the 70s. Tell me about your art. Well, the war all thing was going on, but we weren't part of that. As Mary talks, Andy Warhol wanders into Timothy's apartment from stage right. He is wearing his iconic round, black sunglasses and striped shirt. Timothy takes no notice and cheerfully finishes peeling his mandarin. I think minimalism was happening then. But that was the art insider world. That's what was showing in the galleries, and that's what was hot. The community we were in was different. I, I was doing art more along the lines of Frida Kahlo, very fast. Frida Kahlo walks on stage and stands <laughs> next to Warhol. Timothy peels off the segment and starts chewing. He looks up, sees the artist, and stops chewing. Then he swallows, peels off a couple more segments, and holds them out in friendly offering. Kahlo and Warhol look at each other and then join Timothy. Kahlo sits in the stool, Warhol hovers awkwardly, and they all eat. Kahlo and Warhol successively extend their hands for handshakes, then exit stage right. It was narrative art. It was about being a woman. It was about emotions and relationships. It was the last thing the New York art world wanted to look at because the New York art world was always looking for something that's cool and decorative in one way or another. Minimalism and art. You can do that because it doesn't comfort you with pain or emotions or real stories. I was the antidote. That allowed me to keep my head in the sand in terms of the commercial value of my work. <laughs> because there was no commercial value for my work. No one is going to buy a painting of a woman ripping her stomach in half to hang over the couch. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Eventually, I got my head out of the sand. I realized I didn't want to be a part-time secretary for the rest of my life. So, I went to grad school. I became an art therapist for kids with psychiatric disorders. Did that for 33 years. And eventually I stopped doing drugs and alcohol because they stopped being fun. Drugs and alcohol just turn on you. Sooner or later, they turn on everybody. So, I got sober and clean and got my graduate degree and became a professional and started to paint some sane art. <laughs> 5 a.m. walks back to Timothy's apartment and is soon spotted. Oh, there you are. A at 40, I began to sober up in Alcoholics Anonymous. Raising his hands defensively, 5 a.m. backtracks to center stage. Today, I'm 28 years sober. My son's been back in my life 27 of those 28 years. I just had a grandchild a couple of months ago. I remarried very successfully to a sober woman who you will meet. Tim is the miracle in my life. I mean, really. You've met him. 5 a.m. sighs, nods to Mary, and returns to his school. So, at what point did your father start showing signs of changing, of losing his memory? Well, my biological mother was the carrier of Alzheimer's. So it's more relevant because my father is not genetic. And my mother died prior to my father by a couple of years. Right, sure. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about signs that he was changing. There was a time when she wasn't able to understand who the voice was on the phone. I really don't remember much. At least my memory of it. Tim's stepdad took care of his mother, so we weren't very burdened with her illness. I know the end. 
She would go out to lunch every now and then on holiday. She was sweet as could be, but didn't say much and just floated along with the vibes. I think Tim's dad initially liked having a woman where he could be the boss, but he got more than he bargained for by the end. My father called me from Long Island. I called 911 while he was hanging on the phone. My mother was screaming. She was on the floor just crazy. And then she was taken to the hospital. Mary and I went out there, and she wasn't able to speak. The doctor said she wouldn't leave the hospital. She's the Alzheimer's biological. I mean, that's important. Thank you. You were talking about your mother in the hospital. Yeah, I was there for the hospital visits all the time, every single day. She wasn't talking, and we didn't know if she could hear anything. The, the family was urged to let her go, but my stepfather had to come to some peace. Finally, we stopped her medication. I was alone with her in the hospital room. I held my mother's head while she died. I was sober. Sober for my family. What did she look like when she was in the hospital? She had a wig, but she wasn't using a wig. So she was bald, and that was sort of strange. I mean, she was, she was scrunched up. As with anyone who's dying, they're, they're little. It's a, a very, I can't describe when death is ready. Sure. Did you talk with your father about her money? No. Now, I mean, he would say something about her, that he misses her, she was wonderful, he loved her. Meanwhile, he screamed at her the whole time she was alive. Tell me more about those memories that we would talk about at good times with your mother. She played the piano wonderfully. She knew all about cultural events. They would go to the New York Philharmonic. In the latter years of their lives together, they sat almost holding hands, watching TV. I don't know how that changed from the memory of fear. Tim's stepdad talked endlessly. He would pontificate, and he had to run things. Once, I put my foot down with him when he got really nasty. He was in a hospital room. He was cursing talking to us all like dirt. I said something to him like, that's not right and you have to stop. <clears throat> and he just backed off like a little kid. It was shocking. Let's talk about your father's memory and the theft of it. Step father. <laughs> your step father. Yes. He had to wait it out. He had to wait out his inability to do checks and bills where he was paying $4,000 instead of $40. He was living alone in Manhattan. Of course, he just had to drive. He had to control everything. At one point, we were driving with him, and he almost drove us all right into another car. That was a big red flag. At some point, we took his car from him. It got ugly then, because even his doctor did not support us. But his doctor was not in the car about to be killed. <laughs> so we confiscated his car and hit him. We take him to the diner and he would sort of socialize with people there, but later on he started you know, mumbling his words. We would take him to the supermarket. Grocery shopping got to be too difficult. He got lost in the store. Finally, with the family jokes about this, but we kidnapped him. We all figured that he needed assistance with it. And there was no way he was going to agree, agree to it. He was not too with it at the time, fortunately. We took him to an assisted living facility. And what do you know? He loved it. And then when we said, OK, we're leaving now, and you're not leaving with us. He raised hell. The administrator said, don't worry, we can handle this. So we signed him in and we left. The guy said it would take uh, two weeks, and you'll be fine. Two weeks later, he was happier than he'd ever been in his life. 
with Alzheimer's, you become more angry or you become all of a sudden a nice guy. Everybody knew his name. After nearly all his life, he was finally the prince of the house. It was the best period in his life. He would kid around with the staff about basketball. He made motions about how he would shoot and it would reciprocate. He was conversant without anger. I began to love him in a way that I couldn't believe because I was always terrified of him. We would talk long hours, a lot of times during the week. I learned about his brother. I learned about his childhood. I learned about maybe why he had such a temper, his, his frustrations in life. And, well, we talked. And then talking became a little bit more difficult and more difficult and then Finally, we didn't talk at all, but we just sat together. And that was okay. Timothy sits cross-legged on the stage. Can you say more about the things you were talking about? Oh, he didn't really talk. I asked him questions. He didn't ask about me. He did say that he loved me and that I was a good boy. And it was nice weather. I sat on the bench with him outside. He would go wild over the babies. 5 a.m. sits next to Timothy. He talked about growing up in the Bronx and his brother Lou, who was the favorite, handsome. The girls all liked Lou. He loved Lou, and Lou died at a young age. He was in the service for a while, and he met my mother and me and her parents at Long Beach. He came over, and he started to play with me. I had good memories of him playing. He taught me how to ride the waves on the ocean. He talked about playing basketball, about being all city from New York. He talked about his wife, my mother. She was such a good woman. Did you put your arm around your father's back or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I hugged him a few times. And I was helping him move a lot. Did he ever say anything strange? mid-80s still felt attracted to him. <laughs> In his assisted living facility? Yeah, his assisted living facility. Other women. Really? We were sitting in a lounge one day, and an old woman with a walker shuffles by and he says, Oi, Gavalt, would you look at those ass cheeks? <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, so sometimes fast and sometimes slow as his, his speech was going. Sometimes he would show frustration that he couldn't get the words, but generally he slipped further into the dementia, and, and it wasn't torture. He just, just went into it. At the end, he was just making faces, trying to be funny. It was almost like a child. When he got to that point, what would you do? Make faces back. So we're talking about like sticking up your tongue, or when Yeah, yeah, like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Still finds a new Yeah. Right to the end. Uh, then he started having issues with diabetes. So maybe it's hard. He was in the hospital. He would get angry at the hospital attendants sometimes. Almost appropriate. What made his frustration appropriate? How would you feel if you didn't understand that? They're drawing your blood or taking your pressure. I mean, we know what it is, but they, I think he doesn't know what it is. Why are you moving me in a wheelchair? Why are we going to this place? You try to explain it to him, but of course he doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. His father raised him to be a prince who would have a coterie of people to handle things. But I was raised to handle everything. So I took care of the finances. Suddenly you have to figure out where everything is and how to pay for everything and taxes. Plus constant trips to the hospital. Plus, you have a job and a life of your own. He's totally naked and screaming at EMS people, but the EMS people can't take him in the ambulance unless he calms down, and they're not permitted to sedate him. He's screaming, please help me, please help me, someone please help me. He's strapped to the chair in the nursing room. He can't say a word. He's just trying to unknock the strap that's holding him. Once again, I was in the room when he died. 
Mary was also. The family had a vigil at the end at the hospital. We, we were all waiting for him to die. They had taken away the, uh, you know, the, do not resuscitate, do not resuscitate. We were waiting, and he was there, and, and we were sleeping on the floor, and he died. Actually, the memory I have of my mother going back is that she couldn't speak, but she was reaching for words. It, it was hard for her to swallow, and she was gasping for air. Wow. Well, that's the kind of stuff that happened. Tim's parents were lovely to me. He's Jewish, you know, full blown. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's not Jewish in a religious way. I was baptized Catholic, but I am not religious. But we came from different cultures, and they were so accepting towards me. I treasure that to this day. So... So your father eventually passes away. Then what happens with your life? Well, my, my life had already changed because of being retired. Tim stopped working because he had his hepatitis C treatment, which was like chemo. He had made solid money administering the group home, so we had time. Smiling, Mary stands up on the couch and takes a couple high steps with her arms floating at her side. He made me dinner, took care of the household, did all the bills. I really got how these guys back in the 50s wanted their wife at home to tidy up and have dinner ready when they came home from work. Everyone should have some time like that. Mary sits on the back of the couch with her feet resting on the cushions. I like my life, essentially. I like not working. I, I, I do volunteer for AA twice a week. I read a lot, watch old European films, go to the library, go to the gym every day for two hours. And we, we have a condo in Michigan. We go there for two and a half months. And we're going to Paris in the summer, we're going to California, we're going to Miami. Film guru was mad. You see the gazillion of films. He goes to the library and gets films for us, and every night we see a great film. I thought it'd be quite the fuss pot because I'm spoiled by that. We call him the entertainment chair. <laughs> Watching a movie every 15 minutes, we have to stop, and I have to ask Mary. Who are these people? Are these the same people that we watched five minutes ago? It's been that way since I was a kid. Mary stands up and walks down off the couch. As long as one's a woman and one is black and one is Chinese, he's all right. But if you don't have very distinct physical characteristics, then he gets lost quite easily. <laughs> he's got a brain where he's extraordinarily clever. I mean, like a genius in some ways. But in other ways, he's a doofus. Mary sits on the couch. With face recognition and directions, ever since I met him, he's been a doofus in those areas. And then seven or eight years ago, I was feeling I couldn't connect things from point A to point B. Mary lies down on her right side, facing the back of the couch, and stretches out. Finding and, and spelling words was difficult. Mary said my handwriting was slipping, and then I couldn't do math. As if moving in her sleep, Mary rolls left, eyes closed, stretching her left arm up and slowly lowering it toward the audience. I rolled over in my sleep, and instead of hitting Tim, I just hit more bed. It was 5 a.m. He wasn't in the bathroom. He, he wasn't in the office either. But there was a noise. I followed him to the living room where the TV was on. There sat Tim in front of the TV, fully dressed, eating a piece of toast. I put my hand on his shoulder and he turned to me and smiled and said, Mary, my doll, do you know what this is? I said, no. And he said, this is Sports Center. <laughs> I took neurological testing and I was told I had mild cognitive impairment. And three years ago, I did more tests. We tested on spelling, confusion, word finding, and following things in stories and comprehension. This time, the doctor said I had early Alzheimer's. 
Can you describe those tests in a bit more detail, those questions that involve the uh, story? Well, there's a story about someone going to the store, then they get to a, go to a picnic. The questions are, what did they do, what did they say? That's one of the pieces I have real difficulty with. As much as I concentrate, I don't remember the order of events or where they're going. Or, or they'll say a sequence of numbers. Do you remember these numbers? And then they add more numbers. And then they add more numbers. I mean, how many numbers can you remember? How does taking a test make you feel? It makes me feel terrible. They say don't get anxious, but I'm an anxious guy, and when you say that I don't remember what I'm doing, I'm going to get more anxious, and then results are not good. But then you saw a doctor who questioned how anyone could diagnose him when he's taking this med and that med at these doses. Tim got serious about cutting down on his meds. Well, when you go, my spelling has been better. My, my checks have been better. My face recognition is still terrible. But it was in my 20s. He looked better to me, way better. Then the doctor put it in a way that really made sense. Um, he, he said it's true that he still has Alzheimer's disease, but that the medication's a stressor. What, what he gets, these stressors, he, he's just going to look bad because it exposes the underlying disease. I saw this happen recently uh, when he had uh, anesthesia from surgery. He, he didn't know where he was, why he was there. He knew my name. But today, Tim does fine, and, and he's doing his routines. Word finding bothers me. I'm thinking with you, when you called, I had a difficult time expressing myself. I'm just trying to get the right words out. I know I'm using words that I don't want to use. He goes to a gym. He, he goes to his AA meeting. Uh, he, he goes to the grocery store. He watches his show. He buys his newspaper. He can learn new things. It's like he's doing fine. There's a paragraph in the New York Times. And then there's another paragraph. How does it relate? I mean, I know it should relate. We're in, I'd say, the sweet spot of Alzheimer's disease, because Tim is out and about. I go to meetings. I, things are said, and I don't laugh like other people. This happened yesterday. He's happy. I'm happy we both have our lives, and it's good. Mary sits on the stage. There is this hoping it will be very gradual, like it's been, and that we'll both die of something else by the time Alzheimer's gets a real good grip on it. But it's a threat that doesn't ever go away. We forget about it from moment to moment, but it comes back. Recently, Tim has been using the wrong word. It's, it's kind of uh, a word that would be stored in the next zone in your brain. Instead of saying the cat, you might say the cow or the dog. It only happens once every couple of days that I notice. But it's a little worry, like, oh shit, yikes. Whenever I find it difficult to find words, kick in where I feel, oh my god, the end result of this disease is horrible. I don't want to go there. What is it like for you talking about memory loss? I reluctantly acknowledge that I have a memory disorder, but I don't like the word Alzheimer's. Mary uses the word. If I say the word Alzheimer's, it pisses Tim off. He always gets mad at me every time. I end up saying, stop treating me like the enemy. And he thinks about it and he says, yeah, I gotta stop doing that. I'm in some denial here. Mary says that I come home every day with some issues of memory disorder. And I tell her about it. I don't even remember, but she says that I talk about it to her every day. So maybe she's hearing it more than I'm saying. Sometimes I'm tempted to overlook things. 
And if he says a, a wrong word, I don't have to say that's the wrong word, because I understand what he's saying. It's a tight word. You don't want to live in the bubble of denial, but you don't want to be, you don't want to pound away Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's every day. He gets mad. But hey, I can handle it. I can handle that. I'm a woman and I can stick up for myself. Tell me about getting lost. I don't get lost. The support group I go to, those people get lost. They can't travel alone, but that's not me right now. I don't do that anymore except in doctor's offices where I, I can't find my way out. <laughs> so you went through a, a period where you were getting lost, but, but that ended. I think both of us are trying to live more in the moment and not trying to think about tomorrow or next year or the year after so much. We just try to love what we have and love each other and appreciate the gift of the day. Yeah, it just got better. Maybe I just got less anxious about it. Do you remember the time when you were lost? When I do think about the future, though, I do a number of scenarios. I'll give you three that come to mind. Mm. 5 a.m. unscrews the light bulb from the nearby desk lamp, walks behind Timothy, and screws it into Timothy's head. It lights up. Yes! Timothy jumps up, the light bulb bouncing back and forth. 5 a.m. stumbles back. I had jury duty! Timothy walks to the edge of the stage. I know how to walk from here to the courts, but somehow I walk there and I walk past there and I walk right to the border of the South Street Seaport. Timothy sits down on the stage. Everything looked unfamiliar, and then I began to sort of panic. Where was I? What about the court? What about the time I'm supposed to be there? <coughs> One scenario is that I drop dead and Tim is left. What's going to happen? So I've given him a variety of orders on what he should do. He does have a son in California, so I do know that if Tim were in trouble, his son would take care of him. If it happened tomorrow, Tim would be okay financially. Emotionally, he need a lot of help, but he's resourceful. He knows how to reach out for help. I started to ask people on the street. Most people don't want to have anything to do with it. They have things to do. But then finally, this very nice woman, she said, you're 25 minutes from the courts, I said. Really? She said, you have to take a subway to get there. Timothy returns to his chair. 5 a.m. starts walking playfully across the stage, swooping his legs, tossing and catching the light bulb. The second scenario. I'm trying to avoid the scenario. I don't want to think that this is all a very slow process. Um, let's live and there's time to adjust. That's the scenario I get from my support group. And so far, that's what I see happening. We adapt. We might need therapy. We might need doctors. We might need all kinds of things, but we can adapt. I did take a subway. And I got there not too late. Ah! And I knew exactly where I was. It was unbelievable how I took Broadway all the way down. How long ago was this? 5 a.m. tosses the light bulb high in the air. I'm not sure. That's, mm, I would say, two weeks ago. And then 5 a.m. turns and stares at Timothy and the light bulb shatters on the stage. No one reacts. And then, and then there's the third scenario. I, I'm horrified by thinking that I'll slip into a state where Mary would be here, and I wouldn't know she's there. I mean, I have to stay away from that kind of thing. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about in relation to your life or memory loss? Anything? I 
I hope my memory loss continues to be slow. My medication, when I was going to AA, there was not supposed to go to me. But it happens. He was handsome. That's all I needed. He was good looking and, and, and he was speaking and I thought, he's the one for me. He left the AA meeting room. I was disappointed because I was hoping to chat with him. He left and I left and I thought that it was over. And then I went to the subway and there it was. I swear to you, at that moment, I heard a voice in my head say, three strikes and you're out. Meaning you better get over there or you're going to lose this opportunity. So I walked over to him and I said to him, I want you to know that I'm not following you. <laughs> and he said that, I wouldn't mind if you would. <laughs> What's yours? We rode the train back to our stations and he asked me for my number to have coffee. <clears throat> and that was the beginning. You know, I cannot, ethic, you know, I, I, I in no way am so awkward with that piece. This, is, this comes from oral history. Um, and so Timothy and Mary are co authors. On that. Uh, that doesn't mean that I am, you know, absolving myself of the power of the final editorial control. You know, I'm the one who ultimately shapes them, who makes up stories here and there, uh, who changes meanings around. Um, but most of those words are their words, uh, and a lot of those experiences are their felt uh, experiences. And I'm not uh, able to be here. Uh, but uh, hopefully you can watch it online later. Um, I would like to thank both of them uh, as my absent co-authors. Um, for uh, the methodology, at first I thought when I was doing my thesis project that I was going to create um, just like book chapters of everybody who I interviewed and compile them into a book and see if I could shop it around to uh, a publisher. And I met with my advisor, Jerry Alvarelli, uh, who's been wonderful. And he said, these two, Timothy and Mary, I don't really see them in separate chapters at all. I see them on the stage. And I am not a theater person. I acted in one play as Ernest in the importance of the Ernest <laughs> in high school. Uh, but it made sense to me uh, that they could talk together. Um, even though in this play they are in separate apartments, and in real life they, uh, they have two separate apartment buildings. Um, one which uh, Mary uses for her office, where she can you know, continue her arts, um, and the other where they live. Uh, I, I completely just lost my train. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> they're together. They're together in the play, so it makes sense as a theater piece to put them together. Uh, so they stayed that way, and uh, you know, and as uh, I think both Amy and Marshall mentioned, they are, you know, Timothy and Mary is one piece in this larger thesis thing that I turned in, which has short stories of me and my dad, and one chapter that survived of one of my. Uh, interviewees and another play which needs work. <laughs> uh, so, so I, yeah, basically that's how it was created. I just found, you know, tried to find ways in which their dialogue could highlight things, not only about them, but about the other person. You know, when, when 5AM asks uh, Timothy about um, his mother, and he can't remember at all, you know, anything about his mother, basically. And then Mary can jump in and say, well, my mother was always wallpapering and painting the house. That says something. Um, 
And then at the end of the play, I just, you know, they converge on topics. At the end of our interviews, we started both talking about, you know, uh, about their experiences of memory loss. And so that really patched it together nicely. I didn't have to do anything almost. It was, they, they were talking together and the dialogue just was already there in the transcripts.
Um, so that's, that's part of what I try to get in there. And also hopefully some healthy self-criticism. Uh, yeah, because it's probably not good to react to someone's dementia. So when you're taking an oral history and you're going to write it down Put it out representatively, you have responsibility to that story and to the uh, essential truth of that, that story. And yet you're engaged in a creative act in writing the play. And so you have to, you can't be constrained by fidelity to the truth of that story. There's got to be some kind of tension in there of uh, even your own personal ethics. So could you yeah. speak to that a bit? Yeah, totally. Whenever I think about that, I think of the story, or the, the book, the things they carry. I forget the author's name. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because he talks about, you know, literal truth and story truth. Um, and there can be a lot more truth, I think, in things that are fictional representations of reality than what the narrative tells you. Like the, the entire sequence when when Mary uh, wakes up at 5 a.m. and her husband's gone and he's watching TV and eating toast and fully dressed was made up. Like it's like I made it up, but it happened. <laughs> Both. But along the, those lines, you know, were you familiar with or drawing from or inspired by other oral history to stage? Um, artist productions, yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, how they grapple with it, like other, I know, and there's this right. talks at least about these are all the works, yeah, but, but clearly there's still a creative act there in the representation. So right. that tension between these are all the words and I made that up, but it happened. You know, can there's you talk a, a little yeah, bit more about that? There's a lot there. There's a lot there. Um, yeah, Andy Dever Smith uh, is bold. She, she goes out there and she has these characters and she is strong and inspiring. And I am generally a terrifying person. <laughs> so this is like a hard thing for me. <laughs> um, I don't have an answer. I, like, I really, I really well, are there don't. other folks who you were inspired by? Oh, or inspired oral by. history to stage? I guess not William like. Gass a little bit. Uh, talks about um, he really advocates for the power of the storyteller, the, the agency of the storyteller to create truth um, for fiction or fiction for truth. Um, let's see. Studs Turkle. Yep, Studs Turkle, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. The oral historian. <laughs> so oh, working, right. Working is there are course, lots of like, examples. The yeah, exonerated, you can course, go on. There are yeah. many, many of them. Yeah. yeah. So, again, and then just, I guess, generally documentaries that are based on real life. Aaron Brockovich kind of. And some of that was good for me. So. But there is a huge difference yeah. between a play and a documentary. Sure. Mm -hmm. And what you have to decide in the creation of a piece is what are you doing? Are you doing a documentary or are you doing a play? I think you're doing a play based on yeah, your, your truth, your experiences of the truth. Right. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. When I don't have, and I think you have to be very conscious of the difference. Yeah. I, yeah. And that is something that I came to with a lot of struggle. Um, yeah. But, but you're right. I mean, I own this as a play. This right. is a play. <laughs> this is not a documentary. This is not, uh, uh, and I even question, you know, and I question the camera's uh, ability to capture reality in the first place. But anyway, this is not reality. This is, this is a play. Uh, yeah. My, my question is, uh, it went in our little <coughs> read-through yesterday. Uh, uh, my understanding was that we were in separate <coughs> rooms, apartments, buildings, the entire time. Right. Now today, uh, something that you just said uh, during this session gave me the distinct impression that uh, toward the end there, when we are actually having a more conversant right. conversation, that we could be, right. in fact, were, 
in in the uh, three dimensional reality right. that that's what happened. They were in the same room. You, yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'll talk to you later. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Can we go? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Well, I never interviewed them together, but that is, that's correct. <laughs> you never interviewed them together? No. Okay, so I misunderstood. You did not interview them together, but yeah. you felt like the way that the verbiage that they put forward yeah. was actually, could they yeah. could have been in the same room. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not really big into individuality. I think they carried it, I think they carried it. I think it would, my, well, I might as well say it now, I, I, and, I, and it's not my business and you didn't ask, but I, I think is, that they, it would be maybe a great idea if they were in the same room at that point. Yeah. I agree. Because one of the painful things about playing it is that I could never look at Mary. Yeah. yeah. That's actually, and that yeah. is a stated uh, I direction that. in the play. Yeah. Um, but there's no reason by that time that we would take that as saccharine or, you know. That's good. I think that's a, that's a thought. That's, just no, a that's thought. an excellent thought. I mean, stage, stage readings are about also me learning about what works and what doesn't. And so anybody else who has some ideas like that. I mean, well, be awesome. careful. I, I, uh, <laughs> you don't want people, to, you know, giving you prescriptives, but yeah. and, and that's kind of what that was, and so I apologize. No, but no, it just, no. it kind of came up. Uh, I appreciate. I'm not saying organically. Yeah. <laughs> so just going like sort of off of what they just said, you know, given the, the doc, difference between documentary and play, yeah. um, so much of it is not necessarily just the words, but the way the things are said. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, how did you navigate the choices to give directions for your actors on how to say things and sort of interpret, um, say, the tone or the emotion behind, or interpreted emotion, I guess, on your part, in the way that something was said for your actors? Uh, well, maybe they can also answer this uh, together with me. Um, but sure. these actors, I couldn't have asked for better ones. <laughs> uh, yesterday was our first read through. <laughs> this was our second. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, somehow, uh, you know, they have the ability uh, through years of practice, I guess. Uh, I, I mean, I saw Timothy and I saw Mary today. Uh, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's easy to sometimes, you know, in stage directions, I might try and say excited, and there's different kinds of excited in a stage direction. There's excited, I'm angry, and there's excited, I'm like terrified, and, and I'm still, you know, this is my first play, and I'm still kind of trying to navigate sure. how to write stage directions that, that are helpful. Um, but I got you, but you know what? Maybe my interpretation of how it should go shouldn't be, maybe that's how it works in theater, shouldn't be the final interpretation. Yeah, it won't be. It won't be, no. <laughs> <laughs> there are too many people involved. You have a it's, it's a real collaboration. You have a bunch of actors, you got a set designer, you got a costumer, mm -hmm. and they're all the damn director. effect. Yeah, I did say director. Oh, I didn't hear it. The no, damn director. I blocked it out. The dialogue continues. <laughs> One of the yeah. first things an actor usually does, by the way, when they get a script, is they uh, mark out all the stage directions. Oh. They block them up. Really? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's George Bernard Shaw. Yeah. Yes. Then you can't um, do that. Or Pinter. <laughs> what, what of this idea of a three-dimensional reality, I thought that, you know, 5 a.m. the time, then you uh, was this fixed point in time, so I thought from the beginning of the play it was supposed to be a three-dimensional reality. But then I got a little confused when the um, 5 a.m. got up and went to the other side, and then right. time sort of like shifted. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, time does shift when he goes to Mary. I interviewed Mary after I interviewed Timothy. Um, and 5 a.m., you know, it would be fun to actually fully block this and put it on the stage, because I view him as this kind of not really a human person, just uh, uh, you know, a person, definitely an interviewer, especially for the first like five pages. But then also the situation, and also the onset of dementia. And so, 
uh, since he's not a person, he should be able to walk through walls in several city streets and go and say hi to Mary and surprise her. Um, I guess that was just me trying to be silly mostly. Um, but they're struggling, you know, both, both Timothy and Mary are constantly having these questions that 5 a.m. Is, is sometimes adamantly asking, um, how does it feel to have Alzheimer's? Should you, know, should you say Alzheimer's all the time? How should you talk about it together? Um, so, so he's, I don't know. So he's also their interior. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, I'm just repeating what you said. Yeah, yeah, no, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's... Thank you. Yeah. But he's also the idea of temporality being disrupted in both these people's lives because they're framing this murky multi multiple future tense, right? You, the three scenarios, the multiple future tenses really. in their multiply mediated past tenses, in right. their present... The, right, it's a, I love the idea that, that time is represented yeah. on the in space and like Good. breaking the rules of space and wandering around. Good. I mean, I, you know, I do think a lot about that. Because I think that people with dementia have a special relationship with time. Um, my father, just uh, for example, um, you know, he, he believed that his parents were alive. He believed that we were in the basement of his house when we were in, a, in, a, in the assisted living facility. Um, it, it's different when you actually believe that you're in a different time and place than the rest of us experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's something I should continue thinking about. I loved Frida and the... Uh, oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just on the question of time, I was really struck by the, um, the inclusion at the top half of the play of a lot of biographical background story, like just life story yeah. and now, yeah. um, you know, I saw it. I saw the oral history there, and I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit about your choice to include um, include a lot of sort of pretty straightforward life life narrative yeah. Yeah. Um, for each of them of in the, to, you, to begin the play. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be. I don't. I if I were to define Timothy and Mary, I wouldn't define it as a play about dementia. I would I would describe it as a play about two individuals in their lives, and it's and a love story, too. Um, not that dementia doesn't have like a central focus. And so, in oral history, the ethic of oral history is that it's difficult, you know, to, when you interview someone, and you gain um, just a short snippet of who they are, it's very helpful, and it's very helpful for future people who are going to go into the archives and read the oral history, to gain a fuller view of, of who um, of who the interviewees are, and uh, you know, to me, to me, I mean, Timothy and Mary's relationship is just so much more powerful. Like, given the ups and downs of their of their life before meeting each other, um, so yeah, I, I mean, I totally got stuck. I think you did an amazing job of giving a sense of the, as much as the complexity, but also sort of the scope and the, over time of their lives in this condensed um, piece that you did. I, I and mean, I felt the payoff of like the biographical approach, you know, like knowing these people from, just knowing something about their elementary school experience or something right. about their, their, their young years. Right. It's called backstory. Right. Backstory. <laughs> That's good. It, no, that's great to hear because I do worry. Like, is this going to really seriously bore the audience? Because <laughs> uh, did it? Did it? No, not with those actors. <laughs> yeah, not with these actors. Not with these actors. <laughs> the context is always appreciated. Okay. Good. Good. It's always, and it has to be. And the battle is always. I want to give context that is meaningful and it's not just information. That's the key. Right? Yeah. But it also was good. I, I felt that, um, that there was a slowness to it, right? The, you know, these were just things about their lives, and, um, and that the play actually built up um, and the energy 
built up, and so you needed those first parts in order to, to feel that, or to care, or yeah. to be invested. Right. And, and it contests this idea that, that, I mean, it complicates maybe what an audience brings to the, knowing that this is a play about memory loss. Right. But begins with memories. Right. Mm -hmm. Of course. It feels like really important. Yeah. No, memory. <laughs> Memory loss and Alzheimer's disease are so different from our general understanding of it, which is the which is the shriveled figure who has no sense of where they are or who they are. And that's also why I wanted to interview people with dementia, because their their stories or non-stories or non-narratives uh, are still super important to listen to. Um, they're still super important to engage with, just as important as any other individual. Um, unfortunately, they are commonly isolated um, by, uh, by fear, um, by not knowing what to say when uh, uh, you meet someone with dementia. Um, so, so, people should know it's, it can be very fun to talk with people with dementia. And dementia can, and people with dementia can have a wonderful time. <laughs> and it's not all a tragedy. There's, I mean, it's a tragedy. There's, there's, I mean, I'm not discounting any of the tragic parts, but it's not all a tragedy. So, yeah. I'd like to speak to that because I think that's, that last sentence hit home to me so strongly. My mother had dementia. I'm writing a series of essays about the experience. And over the 10 years, mm -hmm. there were such moments that were nothing short of magical, yeah. nothing short of revealing. Yeah. I learned in those 10 years who my mother was. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I would, and this is the part that speaks to your this is not tragic. I wouldn't trade those 10 years. Yeah. And they made yeah. me a different person. I said the same exact thing to, so, to my older thanks. sister this same. I said, I said, I would not, you know. And I, my father passed away last year, and when he did, I said, you know what? I would never trade the last few years I've had with my dad for anything. Me too. And she was like, really? But he was suffering, which is true. Yeah. And maybe it's selfish of me, but I don't think completely. Does he like dancing? And he likes making friends at the uh, assisted living facility. And I don't want to write them off. There's a man who blogs about having Alzheimer's who talks about an individual approaching him and saying, "Oh my God, if I had, if I had, if I knew I had Alzheimer's, I would shoot myself. I would end my life." Uh, well, that's, which is that's one alternative. Yeah, that's one alternative, sure. <laughs> uh, but it's also just a distillation of our like social understanding of what dementia is, which is like a horrible, terrible like, ending. But the horrible and terrible often comes from how we deal with it. It's not just what's happening in the brain. So. I thought the whole uh, place and time element was great because it took me as an audience as joining what was going on because I felt kind of confused, but I kind of appreciated actually with this story that I felt kind of confused. Right. It made me feel more a part of it. And I also love the whole backstory because I mean, part of what goes on when someone has dementia is anybody from the outside that comes in that doesn't have a history. You so desperately want them to understand yes. who this person was and where they're yes. coming from, and yes. the communications they're making, that you can kind of get threads to what it means, and you just so desperately want kind of anybody else that's part of their lives to kind of understand how, how big they were or how wonderful they were. That's what huge. Who that's, they are. And my friend Nikki back here, who uh, uh, she, she does that. She's a hero. She's one of the heroes who does that uh, for people with. Uh, intellectual disabilities, uh, you know, taking oral histories and filling people in on the fact that these are human beings. Uh, she's awesome. Yeah. Let's talk again the series in November. <laughs> <laughs> this is more a comment than a question, too, but I, I just really love the way that you created the 5 a.m. character and, and especially the, the frustration that, that, that he displayed so clearly. Um, and the annoyance of Timothy being asked these questions at times. Um, and I think a lot of that is present in oral histories, yeah. but we, you know, as interviewers, we're trained to kind of 
to hide that yeah, totally and, right. and so this dramatization of it lets us see that whole internal side of the oral history process. But also, I would say probably comes somewhat from growing on your experiences as a caregiver. Yeah. And, and you know, showing things uh, just annoyance and frustration and, and anger yeah. even at 5 a.m. is right. really interesting. So I thank you for bringing that to the stage. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy. To appreciate it. Also, in listening to Sam's interviews, realized uh, how many interviews I conducted with people with Alzheimer's without knowing it. Mm -hmm. And just by the tone of the voice and the hesitations and the length of time, a couple I knew, <laughs> the ones who didn't get past the 1930s. <laughs> but it was, it made me realize that oral history, along with hearing and listening, if you really need you as a partner, has this potentiality because of its nature, its slow nature, its willingness to wait <coughs> and listen and wait for memory to come, not just history, but wait for memory to come. Mm -hmm. You've helped realize that potentiality, and I hope that you will write about that and that you'll push us in the field further than we've been. The partner of the narrative does need to use this approach that you design yeah. um, and to use it in situations where other people can transform the narratives into plays. Yeah. I mean, Elder Show the Arts is a venerable oh, organization. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for 40 some years. Mm -hmm. And basically, what they do is they, they work in assisted living facilities or nursing homes, as they were called, with people who you know, are in their elder years. And but it's been happening forever. You know, Mary Gordon working with the Ruben Queens, and then you know, she writes a book about her father who had dementia, and then you know, they do plays at the end of all these series of interviews. So I think you can articulate that. You can push us towards that. You yeah. can make it some a part of our practice. I would like nothing better. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, what interests me, Mary Marshall, about that, this, me too, I'm sitting here thinking about oral history and performance in theater. Um, but because I know that Jack Saul and the trauma studies and um, the Center for Survivors of Torture um, folks um, as well as, I think, certain veterans groups uh, with PTSD stories find that it's not just the gathering and the creative process of them making it into a play, mm -hmm. but then it's that um, mirroring aspect mm -hmm. of somebody being able to watch their own words yeah. being exactly. informed to it's that. Right. Quite a bit here, right. Um, and, you know, and it's interconnections with kind of you know, making connections suddenly available. Yes. Yeah. And so I know that the trauma that that's a big part of the trauma studies is that in the for for instance, first reading throughs, it's all just closed to the outside world, but the people whose stories they are are there kind of helping frame but also themselves gaining yeah. meaning from watching. I mean I think I can share when I a little bit of the feedback that I got when I shared the play with Timothy and Mary was Mary uh you know me back and said I just love that line, uh, what is it? <laughs> Jesus Christ, they're made for each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say that I, I, uh, am, I've done a lot of ethnographic interviewing in various settings. Um, and one thing that it's, I think really, one thing I've learned is there's an enormous reparative aspect to this. Uh, the very fact that you are listening and that they are, that they, that you're, that the person that you are interviewing is considered important enough to be listened to and logged has an unbelievably, uh, uh, a, a larger uh, result than you imagine. Um, for instance, uh, let me see if I can be articulate here. Um, well, I was I was interviewing a recovering drug addict substance abusers, 
uh, with AIDS uh, at the Women's Center up at Montefiore Hospital for about six years. It was part of a CDC grant. The end product were role model stories which were edited and passed out in the community. Obviously, everyone was rendered anonymous and the tapes were destroyed and everything done properly. Um, <clears throat> and the, the thing that of, of all of the good it did, getting the stories out into the community, the idea was we'd pick this pamphlet up in the bodega and say, oh shit, you know, uh, somebody else is around here, if this happened to them, and they went in here and they got some help. So, you know, there were many possibilities. It's dangerous uh, information to be talking about in your own community and so forth. Um, but the through line, the thread, the thing that tied them all together without exception was that the experience of doing it made them feel that of all the horror that had been experienced, something good was going to come out of their reporting this experience into the world that they were now interacting with in an entirely different way. So I just want to Actually, in your thesis, you Sam mentions this connection that this work really brought into between the personal and the political. And I was going to say one of the things that um, that we haven't you know directly talked about, but we're just here, I think, in this conversation, is there's a public advocacy piece that is clearly here that having this kind of a work. Um, and putting it out in the public really does something wonderful in terms of enabling people to really have these conversations, um, to connect with people with dementia in a different way, to connect with caregivers in a different way. Um, and I think yes. that that's really <clears throat> But the reparative aspect on the interviewee is enormous. Right. Or but at but least when it, when it goes out into the world, yeah, that's another. That's the expectation. It's a narrative. Of that's what you expect. Also, it, right. It You're being narrating more, what yes. it means to have dementia because because people have a new cognition. And then there's a whole other ethical question, story. right? There's an enormous ethical question here, which is most times when uh, things are derived directly from oral history. Uh, or from someone telling you their story or so forth, they don't reap any reward financially. Right. Uh, and I'd like to see that thought about in the yeah. rest. No, and I, I'll say it here on camera. <laughs> it's going to be a narrative on my co office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I, I'm not. I but think I, that's a I, really important aspect totally of the you. whole. And it's, a, it's, it's unfortunately a radical statement, but it's got to happen. Yeah. Certainly, speaking of oranges, the new black. Certainly, there are lots of traditions of incarcerated women stories in particular. Absolutely. Too, there's the there's the one book by oh, the author whose name I'm forgetting, and then the Eve Ensler project that came uh -huh. from what I want my words to do to you. And there's these multiple traditions, and I know that the women involved in what I want my words to do to you actually wrote, but then had very famous actresses come in to Bedford Hills and perform their own words back to them. And, mm -hmm. and people were people were really excited. Like, Glenn Close is saying my words. This is really yeah. exciting. Right, that's but great. I don't know from the sale of the book. I, I, like, exactly. I don't know what that yeah, happens. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's very, it very rarely comes back to the source. I yeah. did a, a Broadway show a, couple, a year and a half ago called Hands on a Hard Body, which was taken from a documentary film, and we found those people, and we gave them a percentage. It bombed, so they didn't make it. <laughs> but that was not the expectation. Oh, wait, somebody here's The right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and it, 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 it was uh, a, it, it, it was a heartbreaking, you know, thing because it was a beautiful piece of work. But anyway, they did the right thing, yeah. so it can be done, and not necessarily have the commercial outcome. Right on. So, so maybe a couple more questions. And then... well, this is a question that I think the public advocacy component is undeniable. Yeah. But what interests me is the private advocacy. 
and how the reading of this is and you're talking, you represent yourself as going over some real fears and not having to be, as we learn in the world history, the authoritative narrative, uh, which is very different than journalism and really, so this is more of a comment. Um, and so I, I also wonder, you know, we also learn in oral history, what will future scholars and historians learn from this? So my question to you is, what will future scholars and historians learn if they see it in a document form? Yeah. <laughs> With five minutes. Time out. There are a couple of things. I mean, there's the, there's the play. And so maybe they'll learn about how someone tried to bring voices of people with dementia uh, to the public and how that works. <laughs> and then there's also the archive full of histories, uh, unedited or slightly edited uh, for uh, comprehension. Um, I've yet to archive those in Columbia, I guess I've done. Um, and from those, I hope, it's in a, I hope it's an entirely new kind of source. Uh, I hope, uh, you know, somebody's like, wow, I actually have uh, primary source material um, of someone with dementia talking about their experience uh, riding a trike <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Oh, one, one last? Sorry, um, you, you were discussing earlier about how this can have a, doing things like this can have a, a positive impact on like the people you interviewed, people seeing their stories. And I'm just wondering, since you have such a personal connection to this as well, yeah. how creating this impacted you if you got some sort of positive benefit from it, if it was just sort of neutral, if maybe it brought up negative feelings, how did, yeah. how did you, I mean, yeah, no, it was very complicated because my dad died and I had my thesis to do and I stretched it out. I didn't just get it, I didn't count it out, I just stretched it out for several months. And so I felt like I was in a suspended state of mourning until I turned my thesis in. So that was hard. Um, but it was also cathartic to finish. And it was cathartic when I was up late at night. Um, as I talked about before, just getting the high that the creator gets is great. Thanks. And I, I mean, previous to this, I had never made anything that I wrote public, and that's cathartic itself. And it's complicated, and I, you know, I don't even know if, you know, I, I don't even know if it's healthy for me to continue working with people with dementia. But uh, I don't know. I guess I, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's the answer. I don't know. You're still writing your own story. Yeah. yeah so, uh, <coughs> so, thank you for coming.